Good afternoon. Today, we're going to have a whistle-stop tour of ICH Q3D, and we will follow this presentation outline. The background, timelines, risk assessment process, change control, and then what happens during inspections. First, we'll start with the background. ICH Q3D was conceived to supplement Q3 A and B, which concentrate more on organic impurities and degradation products, and also Q3C, which identifies acceptable levels for residual solvents. Q3D itself specifically relates to identifying acceptable limits for elemental impurities that provide no therapeutic benefit and which may be a present in a drug product. The guideline currently considers limits for three routes of administration, oral, parenteral and inhalation. The scope of the guideline is clearly defined and it is stated that it is not applicable to a number of products including herbal, radiopharmaceutical, vaccine and blood derivatives. Importantly, it's also not applicable to products in clinical research stages of development. The document itself is 73 pages long. However, the guideline part is just 12 pages long, with the remaining pages being explanatory appendices, and the document is relatively clear to follow. The timelines are as follows. The document was issued in December 2014 and was initially to be applied to new products being developed. There was, however, a requirement for this to be applied to existing drug products from 36 months after publication, which meant it came into effect from December 2017, and that's why we're looking at it now. If we now look at the risk assessment process, the guideline covers 24 elements and on page four of the guideline, it splits them into four categories based on their toxicity and also their likelihood of occurrence. Class one, human toxicants, which have limited or no use in pharmaceutical manufacture. And there are four elements there. The next level down are considered to be root dependent human toxicants and are split into two categories. Class 2A, those with a high probability of occurrence, and there's three elements for those. And class 2B, those with reduced probability of occurrence, and there's 10 of them. And finally, class 3, relatively low toxicity by oral route, and there's seven of those. How they actually came up with these limits for each element can be found in Appendix 1 of the guideline. So you need to carry out a risk assessment that considers each of these impurities and their potential route for entering your drug product. The guideline presents a fishbone diagram that shows the areas that should be considered for each product. The elemental impurities could be residual catalysts from the API manufacturer, present in excipients, leached from the manufacturing equipment, from the water system, or from the primary contact packaging materials. The output of the risk assessment will then identify the expected levels of each of the elemental impurities in your product. The guidance identifies permitted daily exposure levels for each element by each route of administration. And if your risk assessment identifies you will consistently be within 30% of that limit, the green area here, you don't need to do anything. If your risk assessment identifies that you will be above 30% in the orange area here, you need to add in additional control measures uh, to make sure that you don't go above the 100% of the PDE. For example, you might have a routine testing built in. But if the levels are expected to be above 100% of the PDE into the red area here, then measures will have to be introduced that reduce that number down to an acceptable level. We'll now look at change control. So once you've completed your risk assessments, you need to consider the impact of any changes that you make. So that could be to excipients, synthetic routes, 
manufacturing plant, water systems, etc. And you need to do this routinely as part of your change controls. And so it might be wise to build that into your quality system as a specific question to consider this. And really, what you want to do is you want to avoid pushing your process over the edge and into non-compliance. So finally, let's look at what happens during an inspection. So there's now been sufficient time to implement this process. And so we'll be checking to see during inspections if you've completed the risk assessments. Also making sure that you haven't just put them in the filing cabinet and forgotten about them. And we'll check that they're living documents for your process and that they're up to date. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your attention and have a good day.